Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to Honors World History. Today we're going to be discussing the period of stagnation in the Ottoman Empire after the rule of Suleiman. So last time we talked about the rise of this great empire that would go on to dominate sort of this area of West Asia for several hundred years. Now we'll talk about why the Ottoman Empire didn't become this massive unifying force and why it eventually started to shrink and decline. Obviously, the Ottoman Empire is going to go through a period, a number of periods of reforms, a number of revivals, because again, it's going to last all the way until the 20th century, really not falling apart until World War I. So, but let's talk about the th things that happened after Suleiman that led to it sort of falling apart. So before we do that, we need to talk about Suleiman the lawgiver. Suleiman, Suleiman is probably the most famous Ottoman sultan. Uh, he has a variety of different things that should be laid at his feet here. He was known as the Kanun or the lawgiver by, because of his creation of a civil law code. So the Ottoman Empire up until this point had been governed by religious Islamic law, Sharia law, and a lot of the various millets were still governed under their various religious laws and codes. So what Suleiman did is try to create a unifying law code for the entire empire. This was important both because it helped bind the Ottoman people together and also because it decreased the power of local religious leaders who up until this point had been the main arbiters of lots of these disputes. So because Suleiman and his court officials and his judges now were the ones settling a lot of the things that had previously been settled in religious courts, it's going to increase the power of the Ottoman state. He's also going to simplify and create a more fair tax system, moving away from the sort of tax farming system that they'd used previously. Uh, prior to this, most large empires had used a system called tax farming, you know, going all the way back to the Romans, in which they hire people to go out and collect taxes. These people then go out and collect the taxes from people, and any extra money that they collect, they get to keep. And so tax farmers were hated by the common people because they squeezed them to get as much money out as possible because that's where the incentives lie. And so switching to a system of a sort of civil taxes where the government officials are the one collecting taxes decreased the amount of tax paid and allowed people in general to, to start businesses, to open up new trade routes, to buy consumer goods, things like that. And uh, yeah. He also, of course, continued the policy of allowing religious toleration, assuming people paid the jizya and followed sort of Ottoman law. And so he's considered, as you can see here, one of the greatest sultans of the Ottoman Empire. Take a moment and pause and read this document about Ottoman law, and then we'll move on. All of this, the simplified tax system, the simplified law code, the sort of peace and order created in the empire, led to significant increases in trade. This is happening at about the time in which Europeans and Africans are starting to get interested in Eurasian trade goods again. Uh, the Mongols had reconnected a lot of these areas together, opening up the Silk Road, and Ming China during this time period is establishing larger trade networks within the Indian Ocean or helping to connect China into those already existing trade networks. And so the Ottoman Empire becomes the center of all these goods, the spices from India, the silks and tea from China, stuff like that. And so all of that money flowing into the Ottoman Empire is going to make them spectacularly wealthy. They use some of this money to expand their territories, getting all the way to Vienna in the Holy Roman Empire. They put the city of Vienna under siege, but because of some new European technologies, specifically the creation of star forts, these forts with sort of these uh, angled walls that help deflect cannons, the Ottomans were not able to breach the walls of Vienna in the same way that they were able to breach the walls of Constantinople. And so this siege goes on for a period of time. And in the end, the Ottomans have to abandon the siege and Austria does not fall to the Ottoman Empire. So this is the extent of Ottoman conquest in Europe. The period of Suleiman and after is often considered a golden age of Ottoman literature, of Ottoman culture, of Ottoman society. Again, Ottoman and literature becomes sort of the hallmark of the Muslim world. The city of Constantinople becomes this glorious center of architecture and culture. And the Ottoman Empire is in the being in the center of all these other great empires, becomes a center of trade, of learning, of knowledge, all these different things. And so this is generally considered the height of the Ottoman Empire. They construct the Blue Mosque during this time period, the fabulous domed building in modern-day Istanbul. 
that uh, rivaled the Haji, the great Hagia Sophia in size and uh, scope. And so this, of course, demonstrates the spectacular wealth and architectural skills of Ottoman artisans and builders. And the Ottoman Empire is going to run up against the Portuguese. As we're going to talk about in two units during Unit 4, the Portuguese are one of the first European countries to begin exploring around the world and trying to connect into these Eurasian and Indian Ocean trade networks. The Ottoman Empire is going to face off against the Portuguese in a number of battles, pushing back against Portuguese encroachment in the Indian Ocean. All of these, it's going to test the strength of Ottoman ingenuity because the Portuguese are starting to begin to use these, you know, more advanced ships, more advanced cannons, more advanced weapons, things like that. And eventually, the Ottoman Empire loses the Battle of Lepanto which is a huge setback for the Ottomans. This is one of their first huge major defeats. I mean, the Siege of Vienna was not a success, but it's not really a defeat because the Ottoman Empire chose to break the siege as opposed to continuing to fight. Whereas Lepanto really broke the idea of Ottoman invincibility. And so Lepanto was a joint European Christian fleet uh, in order, which was created in order to try to help Christian nations expand against the Muslim Ottomans. And so although the battle did not, you know, significantly weaken the Ottoman Empire, it made them appear vulnerable in the eyes of many Europeans. So how did the Ottoman Empire go from its absolute height to losing the Battle of Lepanto? A lot of it is that although Suleiman was an amazing ruler in a lot of different aspects, in his personal life and the choosing of successors, Ottoman sultans did not do a pretty good job, very good job. The famous uh, Turkish soap opera, Magnificent Century, highlights the sort of uh, tawdry, behind-the-scenes maneuvering of Suleiman's court, specifically his wife Roxalana and her attempts to turn Suleiman against a number of his sons and push her son, Selim, into the top spot. Suleiman ends up, uh, Suleiman's sons end up getting maneuvered into betraying him in a whole host of different ways, and he puts a number of, and a, a number of them get put to death, and the guy who ascends to the throne is Selim the Sat. So after Suleiman's death, Selim takes the throne. His mother, Roxalana, as you can see here in this picture, is known is mostly ruling from the shadows behind him. And Selim is known for being relatively generous, somewhat intelligent, and drunk all the time. So he's not going to pay much attention to matters of state, letting Roxalana and the various palace viziers handle most things. And most humiliatingly, Selim apparently died relatively young, slipping and falling on a marble floor while he's drunk. This went into, yeah, this contributed to the Ottomans losing a series of unpleasant wars. They fight a series of wars against the Venetians, which significantly weakened the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Venice, as we hopefully remember from our Renaissance unit, had become a center of sort of trade and commerce. And so they go to war against the Ottomans a couple different times, further draining the coffers of the empire. And... Although a lot of the sort of mothers and wives of the sultans do their best to rule effectively, Ottoman governance really suffers during what's known as the Sultanate of Women. Generally, these women, in order to keep power, make sure that the sultan is a combination of young, incompetent, uh, inebriated, or all three. And so a lot of these sultans don't pay much attention to matters of state. All of this palace intrigue leads to, like, really takes a lot of effort and takes a lot of time from the Ottoman sultans and their courts as far as ruling goes. For a lot of them, they become much more in much more focused on sort of outmaneuvering their rivals, uh, assassinating people. It's really quite dramatic and it doesn't lead to particularly good governance. So really the thing that keeps the Ottoman Empire going during this time period is the Devshirme system and the sort of bureaucracy that was created is relatively effective. And so despite the fact that there's a lot of bad rulers in place, because the Ottoman government system is efficient and is relatively streamlined, and the people are put in charge based on their skill and knowledge, they're able to continue to rule the empire, even without a, clear, a leader with a clear vision sort of pushing them forward. And so the Kaprulu visors, viziers here 
help to expand the empire into territories that it hadn't previously controlled. They, uh, you know, are able to hold the empire together through a series of European wars. And the Ottoman Empire is going to decline to some extent during this period, losing some territories in the Balkans, losing some territory in North Africa. Eventually, the holy cities are going to break away from the Ottoman Empire and become independent in their own right. But the empire itself does not collapse. The Great Turkish War is a war on what, between what's called the Holy League, the uh, Holy Roman Empire, the Polish, the Russians, the uh, Venetians, all of these Christian states pushing back against the Muslim Ottoman Empire. They launch a series of attacks, freeing a number of Baltic states from the empire in the late 16 and early 1700s. And they leave the empire in significant amounts of debt, sort of adrift because of a lack of, again, clear leaders with a clear vision, and uh, significantly weakened with a unified Europe able to you know, push back and take significant territory from the Ottoman Empire. And so during Suleiman's reign, the Ottoman Empire was sort of the height of culture, of learning, of military might. By the mid, by the late 16 and early 1700s, the Ottoman Empire has become an empire in decline. Treaty of Karlowitz takes away a significant amount of Russian territory. It also increases the power of both Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. And the Holy Roman Empire is going to get some control over those previous territories there. All of this is seen as a huge victory for the Christian states of Europe, unified against the, Ottoman, the Muslim Ottoman Empire. And it starts to create this perception. Uh, the whole metaphor of the sick man of Europe doesn't come in until much later, but it starts to create this perception that the Ottoman Empire is old. It's in decline. It's potentially vulnerable. It, could, it doesn't have the ability to project power like it used to be. And rising European states, especially Russia, see the Ottoman Empire as vulnerable. And so we're going to see a series of wars in which the Russians are going to push back against the Ottoman Empire. With the goal of the Russians, they want to eventually liberate the great city of Constantinople, what used to be the heart of Orthodox Christianity, and return it to the Christian fold. So the Ottoman Empire is not done yet. They're going to go through, as we are going to talk about uh, next semester, a series of revivals that allow it to continue to limp on until World War I, but it's really never going to reach the peak that it reached under Suleiman the Magnificent. And so the Ottoman Empire is now in a slow, a slow but terminal decline, and other states are going to take advantage of this. So that brings us to a close of the Ottomans. Tomorrow, we're going to continue to move eastward, look at the revival of the Persians under the Safavids, and then we're going to finish up by heading into South Asia, talking about sort of the basis of South Asian culture, and eventually the rise of the Mughals, the third of our quote-unquote gunpowder empires. So we'll leave you there for now. Thank you for listening.